So welcome everyone to It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborwoods, Exploring Natural Communities with Junior Students. I'm Anne Marie, Communication Coordinator for the Pathway Project. The Pathway Project is a partnership of many organizations centered in Peterborough, Ontario, and directed by Camp Kawartha, sponsored by the Ontario Trillium Foundation. And I would like to welcome our Pathway Co Coordinator, Kathy, to share today's land acknowledgement. Kathy, take it away. Hello, we're so glad that you could all join us today. Now, I don't know if you share the same feelings as me, but I am grateful every day to be able to live in this wonderful area of the Kawartha Lakes um, centered around Peterborough. We would like tonight to acknowledge with great respect that we are here tonight on the traditional and treaty territories of the Michisagik Anishinaabeg. We are extremely grateful to the First Peoples for their care uh, through the millennia and their teachings about our earth and our relations. So in the work that we do in the Pathway Project, we, we do our best to honor these teachings and um, it's wonderful to have you all here tonight. It shows that you also care about uh, trying to be the best uh, mentor that you can for the children that you work with uh, and the children in your care. So um, thanks to you and thanks to uh, the Michisagik Anishinaabeg for, um, for um, letting us share this wonderful land. So we're very grateful. And I'm going to pass things back to you, um, Anne-Marie. Okay, well, let me introduce Nancy, the guest of honor. To many students and teachers, Nancy is Nature Nancy. She is an outdoor activity consultant for the Pathway Project. And for the past six years, she has been running Think Outside, which brings outdoor education programs to schools using local green space to connect people to the earth and each other. She has 25 years of outdoor education experience and is a wealth of knowledge and enthusiasm for the great outdoors. Nancy, welcome. And why don't you tell us a little bit about what you have planned for us this evening? Thank you so much for taking your time after your busy day uh, to, to come and join us. So today the focus will be on outdoor activities specifically for the grades four to six ages. So I hope you enjoy the video. It was really fun to make. I'm looking forward to any questions you have about what you saw in the video or anything with regards to outdoor learning or growing hostas. <laughs> Hello everybody, Nature Nancy here and welcome to It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborwoods. Now today we are going to be looking at different activities to connect junior students to nature and nearby nature and specifically looking at the pathway landmarks from the Pathway Project that match with those junior years. So first we're gonna start and look at what those pathway landmarks are, and then we're gonna go into some activities. So let's get going. Number 13 is traveling by yourself or with a friend at least twice a week on a familiar route. Number 14 is trying at least five different types of outdoor recreation that don't require gas or electricity. Number 15 is trying a bunch of different activities like hanging a bird feeder or growing your own garden or possibly trying fishing or visiting a wetland and seeing what's up there. Also looking for insects or going to a nearby pond to look for an insect or getting to know a habitat and visiting a forest, a meadow, or a wetland. Every living thing needs energy, so visit a place that uses three different types of renewable energy. When you're trying these new activities, include a sport, a craft, and a survival skill that don't require fossil fuels. Encourage people to visit nearby nature and appreciate it. Watch how people use the natural area and monitor the impacts. Explore biodiversity by finding out what lives in a wetland, a forest, or a meadow. Help to understand the relationship between living things and their habitats. So, the first group of activities that we're going to look at today come from a book that I recently discovered. 
um, even after teaching for 25 years out of doors, and it's very exciting to me. It's called The Walking Curriculum, and it's by a woman named Gillian Judson, who's a, a Canadian, and she has created um, many, many different walks, specifically walks based on the idea that you're using your body to move, you're using your imagination, and you're connecting emotion to what you are um, doing with the students and what the students are experiencing. So what I have done today is out of the 45 different um, walks that she has outlined, uh, I've chosen about 10 or so that I think are really great specific to the junior landmarks um, as well as the curriculum um, and that you can use as a really great starting point uh, or you can use it within an, a more extensive program. So here we go. So the first walk is the motion walk and the motion walk involves using your senses uh, to complete this challenge. What's moving around you? Uh, what is on the move, and can you repeat these movements by using your body? So is it the wind making the movement, or is it the creature itself? The next one is the surfaces walk, or the faces walk, where you're looking for faces of all kinds. What surfaces also do you encounter on the walk? How do the surfaces feel? What different faces are made by different things in nature? The next walk is called the lovely and unlovely walk. So in the lovely and unlovely walk, we're noticing what we find to be lovely and what we find to be unlovely. And this is a great discussion point. Why is it that we find certain things lovely and certain things unlovely? How do we perceive them? And what do these items do to contribute to the world around us, whether they are lovely or unlovely? This is a great discussion point for lots of junior students. The next walk is called the underfoot, or you could do an overhead walk. Those are two walks. The underfoot, what do you notice about the world you are walking on? What's the concept of the history of the place? How is the soil being made? Was there water and ice here beforehand? And also looking overhead. This is really good for introducing map making. What is looking above us and what would it see? The next walk is the habitat walk, or it could be the neighborhood walk where we're discovering all the different creatures that share the neighborhood with us. Or you could focus on different elements of habitat. So shelter, food, water, and what is the evidence of what is living in the space or the habitat that is either the schoolyard or the green space. Right here, we've got evidence of a deer sharing the habitat. The next walk is the energy walk. So what is the evidence of different forms of energy? So either the energy needed to create life, uh, the energy that comes from the sun or the water, or the energy needed to grow a plant, in this case, uh, rhubarb, or the energy needed to make heat or energy for human beings, so wind energy. And the next walk you could do is called the rock and walk. What stones or rocks do you notice in the area? And imagine that you're a geologist and are examining the specimens that you find. Maybe do a little bit of research. This walk is called the nature by design walk and it is great for schoolyards, showing the impact of human beings. What evidence is there that humans have shaped this space? What aspects are natural as opposed to being nature by design? And the final walk is the hiding place walk, where you can ask the students to look for what they think is the best hiding spot for themselves. And then thinking about other creatures, 
what would be a really good hiding spot for a creature like this? Or possibly a raccoon, or a mouse, or a spider, or even a snake. Any of these walks can be imagined to be done in any season of the year and enjoyed in lots of different ways. So hopefully you can imagine yourself uh, with your students going on some of those walks and you can also imagine how those walks can go in different directions, cross-curricular or different ideas or ideas that your students will come up with from some of those base walks. Um, this book is available at the Outdoor Learning Store online. If you want it, once again, it's The Walking Curriculum by Jillian Judson, an excellent resource for any teacher, any school, anywhere. This activity is called map making, and it is really good for landmark number 18 and 19. 18 being uh, learning about a, a local natural area, and 19 uh, being about exploring biodiversity. And with map making, it would be a really good idea to do a couple walks before you start this activity. You could do a lovely, unlovely walk, or you could do a neighborhood walk, or you could do an overhead walk. So the students get very familiar with the natural area they're going to be asked to map. Once they've started their actual map, learning about different parts of a map, it would be a really good idea to do sort of overlay of looking at what are some of those creatures that live in the natural area or what are some of the different parts of habitat for some of those creatures that are, are in that natural area. So here I have a couple of different examples of maps of a local park called Bernardo Park. So in this activity, I didn't just focus on landmarks and different parts of the map, but I also focused on what were some of the different elements of habitat here? So I looked at plants and creatures that live there, but I also looked at water sources and different possible shelter spaces. So this was my first map in Bernardo Park. An interesting activity to do would be to compare a different part of the same park or a different park altogether, looking at the elements of habitat and also looking at the different creatures you might see there. And the final activity could be creating an orienteering course where the students take their own map, identify a few key features on their map, and then trade their map with another group and ask them to find those things on the orienteering course. It's a really fun way to finish up this unit. What kind of tree can fit in your hand? Palm tree. This game I'd like to share with you is called Freeze Frozen Critters, and it's a great way to teach about habitat. All you need is an open space, a bunch of hula hoops, some popsicle sticks, and a rope that shows you where the nest area is. So the students all start in the nest area, and here is where they're gonna put their food. And what they wanna do is they wanna to go to the opposite end of the field to get one piece of food, which is a popsicle stick. The only way they can stay safe and away from the fox is if they are either in their nest or in a tree, which is the hula hoop. Then they're gonna make their way over to try and get a piece of food and then make their way back all the way so that they can bring the food to the nest. If the fox tags a squirrel three times with the noodle throughout the whole game, then the squirrel needs to go to the squirrel graveyard and their game is over. And at the end of the game, you look in the bin and see how many pieces of food the squirrels were able to get over the game. Here I have a couple of very eager, enthusiastic players to show you how the, the game works. <laughs> Did I die? Looks like they got four whole pieces of food. Might not last the winter, but they seem to think they've won. An extension to the game of freeze frozen critters is you can stop the students, the squirrels, midway through the game. And you can tell them a story about how popular it is to build houses in whatever community you're in. 
And one of the things that happens is that often trees are cut down when there's new buildings or new roads that go in. So you stop everybody, you take a couple of the trees out of the game. And when you take a couple of trees out of the game, it changes the dynamic of the game. So that's a really good discussion point about what happens when we lose habitat, what happens to the squirrels' homes and their ability to get food. So that is just a little extension on the game Freeze Frozen Critters. Pink noodle bug. Shelter building is an incredible activity. It is universally enjoyed by many, many children. And it's a great cross-curricular activity. It can take many different forms, uh, such as structures or habitat or creativity. The list goes on. So, and it also um, addresses landmark number 17, which is learning a new outdoor skill, such as a survival skill. So lots of uh, applications for shelter building. So one of the ways that you can teach shelter building is by looking at nests and by having the students create their own nest. So it could be a bird's nest or a squirrel's nest or any sort of nest that you want them to experience. Um, this ties into form and function, but it also ties into the strength and stability and habitat and creativity. So there's lots of things that you can tap in with nest building. Sometimes I like, like to use a pair of tongs or a clothes peg to mimic the beak. Um, but it's all about collecting materials, figuring out what makes the nest so strong and so important, and then giving them an opportunity to create and test out their actual nest. So either putting some uh, eggs in it or putting it in, in a spot where you think it's camouflaged, that sort of thing. So the first type of shelter I would suggest looking at is the nest. Who says it takes a long time to build a shelter? Look at her go! Making debris shelters is a great way for the students to play with sticks, which is what they want to do. Uh, it's not only that, but it's a super creative activity. It's amazing for teamwork. You can look at structure and strength. You can look at it as part of a habitat. You can also look at it uh, with regards to loss of heat and where that happens if we're um, sleeping in a structure such as this. Um, it is an amazing activity if you have a nearby woods that you can um, access with uh, your group of students. Another way that you can uh, look at shelters or structure uh, is by doing so creatively. So. Uh, making a piece of art using things from nature is a great way to do that. So you can have certain focuses to the activity. Maybe it's uh, more free or maybe it's more focused on structure. But uh, I created this lovely piece uh, to give you an example. And with regards to um, extensions to all three of the activities, so nest building, debris shelters or art, a really good way to tie things together is to do a gallery tour of each of the creations so that the students can talk about what they were thinking about behind their creation. And so questions can be asked and you can look at, oh, is this gonna be strong enough? Or is this gonna be warm enough? Or tell me about your creative process. So that's a few ways to look at shelter building. How do you properly identify a dogwood tree? By its bark. <laughs> A good extension to the walking curriculum could be doing a tiny scavenger hunt, which involves a scavenger hunt for the students to do, but all the things that they find must fit in a really tiny container. It's a great way to look at the details within nature and some of the smaller things. The next activity is looking at biodiversity, which is landmark number 19. And if you only have a yard um, to use, or you have a yard and potentially another green space, this is a great activity to do some comparisons with regards to the biodiversity you see in different, in different spaces. What you need is a hoop for each student or pair of students and some other recording materials. So let's get going. The pair of students will each get their own hoop and uh, put it down within a field space, so somewhere in the yard. And it focuses their area of which they need to look at. And at that point, they're going to get a sheet with which to record on, 
And if you have a way to collect creatures or things you want to look at more closely, having a bug viewer is an excellent um, addition. If not, you can just use a container. So what they're going to do is they're going to look at all the plants and the creatures that they've got within their hoop. They're going to record what are some of the different species that they've got. If they don't know the names, that's okay. They can do a drawing. And then you can use it for a math activity, like what fraction of the hoop is grass and what fraction or percentage is clover or how many of this number of plants or that number of plants and also how many creatures have they got. And so you're starting at that point and then you're going to find a new space. The second area that you'll be looking at, if it's still within the yard, might be at the edge of the yard where there's a little bit more biodiversity. Or if you have a nearby nature, it could be in a forest area. So you have the opportunity for the students to look at, within their hoop, a completely different group of plants and potentially critters. Also, they can look above the hoop and see what things are growing that are bigger within that biodiversity. So they'll see a big difference between the yard space and the second space, which is either in a, maybe in a meadow or a forest or even at the edge of the yard and you can talk about the comparison. So that's uh, schoolyard biodiversity. So here's an example of two sheets you could use for the two areas that you are going to compare in the schoolyard biodiversity activity. Part of Landmark 15 is to explore a habitat. And if you have a nearby woods, a great activity to explore that habitat with is making a terrarium. And each student can make their own terrarium or you could make several for the class. A great resource for lots of activities, but especially for terrariums in this case, is the Big Book of Nature Activities by Jacob Rodenberg and Drew Monkman. And in it tells you step by step how to make a terrarium. And that's what we're going to do right now. The good thing about terrariums is that you can focus on many different aspects of the terrarium. So for example, you can look at soils and the layers of soil, uh, or you could look at habitat and what's in uh, this micro habitat. And also you can look at some biodiversity. So looking more closely within the forest. In order to make a terrarium, there's a few items that you will need that are really easy to get. Um, you need some sand, some carbon, which you can get from a pet food store or a pet store. You need pantyhose, an elastic, and you need a jar or, so it could be a, a glass jar, or it could be a plastic container, something that's clear. And it really helps to have some sort of spray bottle of water, some sort of source of water. So you can see here that uh, you need to create a layer within your terrarium. The bottom layer is either small rocks or sand, and that allows for the filter or the drainage of the water. Then you've got a very thin layer of the carbon. So this is, this is what you can get at a pet store actually. And then you have a couple inches of soil from the bottom of the forest. And that creates the space with which to plant and, and bring some items. So what I've found at the bottom of the forest is this rotting stick that actually has some lichen on it. I've found uh, and received, uh, actually retrieved a couple of plants that have their roots in them, some moss and a rock. And in this case, this will probably fill up the whole terrarium. Remind the students to protect the root in the soil and that no big creatures should be living in their terrarium. So here I have my beautiful terrarium. And once you've created the terrariums with the students, they can take them back to the class and make sure they're out of direct sunlight. Um, the other thing that you need to remember is to keep them moist. So having a spray bottle is really important. So you take off the pantyhose, you spray them down, making sure things are still living and moist, and then you keep the, the pantyhose back on the top. And I often do this in the fall because uh, they can have them throughout the winter in the class. And then in the springtime, you can take back the items back to the forest that you got them from. So that is terrariums, really, really enjoyable activity. What did the limestone say to the geologist? Don't take me for granite.
So here I am with my grade four class, and we're about ready to go and do some rewilding activities, which directly relates with landmark 15, um, establishing a sense of place and belonging. And these activities that we are going to do uh, allow the students to connect with a place and are really important for developing that stewardship to the land and to each other. So here we go. Our first rewilding activity is called sit spots. And as you can see, my class is separated within a natural nearby area and they each have their own spot with which to sit. And the sit spot is a really great activity, but it takes a while to get the students comfortable with it. So one of the activities you could do before you do sit spots is sort of like a hide and seek game or a camouflage game to get the students comfortable with that area. Once the students are in their sit spots, you can keep it fairly structured to start, um, such as you could ask them to draw or you could ask them to do a journal entry, or you could do an activity such as nature reporters, where you ask the students to come up with a question, an open-ended question about something in nature that they're watching or they're seeing or they're smelling. And that's nature reporters. But sit spots, as they get more comfortable with it, can become more student directed. They may have ideas or it may just be a time to sit and listen and relax. That's sit spots. Considering uh, some students stay at a school for so many years, Going back to that same spot and doing something like sit spots is a really great activity for students to really build that connection to place. Uh, but also while they're there and doing some of the activities, some of those, uh, some of the work that they're doing at the sit spot can be brought back to the class. So for example, they could uh, take some of the questions they come up with and do a creative uh, writing assignment or they could do a research assignment. So there's lots of applications to sit spots and they really are beneficial. One of the activities I like to do is looking at different adaptations that uh, animals have in order to help them survive. So for example, looking at human's eyes versus say a deer's eye or a horse's eyes and where they are on the body. So as predators, our eyes are right in the front we need a good focus, we need a sense of depth perception, and it allows us to really be um, a really good hunter. However, if you're a deer, your eyes are on the side of your head, and so you can see a lot more, but you can't see the detail, but you do see a lot more movement. And as prey, who are always being aware of making sure that they're staying safe from their predators, that adaptation is really important. So one of the activities I like to do to start is looking at what our peripheral vision is used for. So it's not very detailed, but it's good for movement. And you can use this activity to introduce it where you have the spot, your hand stopped or your finger stop where you can actually see them. And it shows students where their peripheral vision is. The next activity is fun if you have a little bit of a forest nearby. In this game, you're gonna ask the students to use their peripheral vision. So most of the class is gonna find a really close hiding spot just off a trail into the forest. And then there's gonna be a couple of students who are going to walk straight down that trail, not looking side to side, but using their peripheral vision to see how many of their friends they can see. So as they're walking down the trail, looking straight ahead, they may see a couple of their friends. So those were a few rewilding activities that you could do with your students, and there are so many more. And they can be done any time of year, in any space, to connect the children to nature. Thank you so much for coming to It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. And also, thanks so much for all that you do with kids and for taking them to learn outside. See you soon. This is the third portion of our evening, the Q&A. So while you're getting your ideas together, um, our Pathway team thought up some ideas for you, Nancy. So here's some questions from them. 
we are eager to know. When you're exploring habitats and biodiversity with students, do you need to stay land-based? Do school safety regulations make it impossible to explore wetlands, ponds, streams? I would love for um, teachers that are experiencing this also to chime in with some of the things maybe they've tried to do a wetland study and maybe you can talk about some of the barriers to doing that. Um, I actually, if I was to choose the best way to look at biodiversity, it would be going to a wetland. It is, it is just so rich and it's quite easily accessed in, in me, at many schools. It's quite surprising. For the last couple years, I have, I have found that uh, there's a lot more uh, process that you have to do with regards to uh, being able to take your students to water. Um, I think it, it really, I think that there's a, pro, uh, a sheet that you have to sign or you have to get per, special permission um, at, that, at the um, board level. Um, but I may be wrong on that, because by the time I get to uh, a class, if the teacher has put um, the work into getting that, that permission, then uh, we're able to go to the wetland. So um, is, are there any teachers that have tried, um, that have tried to take their, their uh, students to the wetland and had difficulty with that? I'm not sure if anyone has or not. It's also about having equipment too, but the equipment isn't expensive um, and having enough, uh, feeling confident enough that you're gonna have the kids by the, by the water. So having enough adult bodies too is really important. Tori, just a comment about the different walks and observing what is around them. I took a course on mindfulness in childcare and one activity that I really loved was taking a mindful moment by lying down on the ground and using the senses to talk about what the children can see, hear, feel, and smell. It was a great way to help children regulate if they just needed a moment to center themselves. I've done it mostly indoors, but even more exciting to do it outdoors. I feel like that would work really well with your sit spot too. Like that's kind of... Yeah, you're, you're doing that, you're establishing that routine. And I think the more that you do it out of doors, the more it just becomes something that you do. And, and I've been doing, like when I take uh, kids snowshoeing in the winter, every time I take them, even if they're in the yard, I just get them to lie down in snow and just lie there and just, and then we just talk about what they smelt, what they heard, all that sort of stuff. And I, more than ever, uh, I find that the kids need that time. They want to play the games. They want to do that, but their their bodies need that time for sure, and their brains. Um, Nancy, if you're working with grade six students exploring biodiversity and they want to discover the names of something they encounter in nature, are there apps you would recommend that could help with student identification, or do you have any go tos? I find iNaturalist is one I go to. And then I was talking to Kim Dobson. She likes Seek. She finds that it's very, it's quite quick and quite accurate. Um, so those are two I would suggest because it just involves taking a picture. Um, I haven't had a lot of success with bird calls, like trying to record the bird calls. But if someone has a good bird app, I would love to know about it. Oh, I can't imagine that Kathy doesn't know a good bird app. Well, or she's somewhere Kathy just probably group. knows it. Yeah. So. And on our YouTube uh, web page, Kathy did an amazing uh, workshop on bird calls. So if you're wanting to get younger students involved in that, check out our YouTube page um, for her workshop on that. It was really interactive and a lot of fun. Cornell uh, Kathy, website. Cornell, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's, she loves Cornell. And honestly, it's an amazing resource. So um, Cornell Labs, if anyone's looking online uh, for all things birds. What about if students are picking up things from nature for shelters, nature art? I mean, these are great ways to get kids outdoors and involved. How do you decide what's okay to use, what's not okay to use? You know, we don't want to harm mother nature, but at the same time, we want to learn to explore it. So what's your sort of go-to rules? I use my activities as an opportunity to have a discussion with the students and find out where they're coming from. So some students in some classes have, have quite a strong relationship to nature. 
and a, and a strong feeling about what's what should and shouldn't happen while they're outside and some are quite new and you know could could be a little more uh they they might want to destroy more let's just say or or not worry so much about uh learning that that's something or someone's home so um so often we'll come up as with rules as a class about what makes the most sense uh, with regards to, hey, that could be a creature's home. Um, so if we're making art, uh, some of the basic things that, that the students usually come up with is you, you don't pick anything living. You can use things that are in the ground, but if you notice it's a home or you know, you're picking up a log and you notice that there's something living under there, then you put it back. Because really anything they move is going to be a home for something. There are creatures and everything. But that awareness um, with regards to natural items. But generally speaking, we, we ask the students just to use things on the ground. Like actually they come up with it, I mean. I suppose, you know, when with the older, with the junior level students, you know, they're giving them a little bit more breadth to move around, to go hunting for materials, to do activities. So do you sort of, how far do you allow them to go? Do you, do you still need to establish boundaries? Do you do that in your opening conversations as well um, for the age group? You know, how do you reassemble people <laughs> once they've scattered um, out in, into a, to an area? What's your, what's your advice there? Yeah, I just say, ready, go, yeah. and I just run. <laughs> Um, often I'll, I'll check in with the teacher if I'm, especially when I'm working, uh, that they obviously know their class really well. Um, I've, and I find out how often those, um, how often the students have been in that area that we're, we're in, or if it's a new area, um, to start with, I usually do activities where we stay closer together, um, just so I can get to know the kids a, a bit better. Um, and then we establish rules that work for that specific area. So say I'm in a forest and it's fairly contained and there's a trail on one side and it's open in a field on the other side and I can basically see the whole forest, then it makes it easy because I say all you have, you can only stay in this forest. Um, often I do activities where I'll say, you can be anywhere in this forest, but you have to be able to see an adult at all time. Um, and then in other, other circumstances, um, you know, if, if they, I say, if there's some place you'd like to go um, that's out of view of an adult, then you need, just need to ask and be able to accept the answer. So there's a mix and it really depends on the space we're in. Sometimes spaces are so contained like they almost have a fence or a very, and it makes it really easy to feel confident that the students are going to stay. But some others are like, there's a road right there or there's water over there. And so those discussions are different every single day for me. Um, and I'm sure teachers have the, same, have the same conversations and you start off with them really close and, and close together. And then as you get more comfortable, you find the boundaries get a little bit bigger. Yeah, and I know from working with you, you're always sort of pre-scouting. And I think that's a really important step as an educator, or as a parent, it's okay to go there on your own, check out the space so you feel comfortable, you know what your boundaries are, what hazards might be around. If you kind of know the area, you're gonna feel more comfortable as a classroom might explore on their own. Yeah, yeah, I, there's a lot of scouting in my job especially because I use city parks and every day a city park could look different. Um, so yeah, what Cindy says, I always go into the woods with insect. Oh, insect. someone asked about insect identification. Yeah, somebody wants an app for insects, insect app. Hmm. So Cindy, I'm always going into the woods with whistle to call my class. Oh, she uses a whistle. Yes, yes, yes. When we go outside, I have, I always have a whistle. So if I do, three whistle blows, it means you must come back as fast as you can, but I use a deer collar. So there's more of a, it's a different sound than they would get in gym class. There's a different sound than they might get, you know, in the schoolyard so that it differentiates. Um, so sometimes I like that, but whistles are so effective because <laughs> it, 
it's just, it's a really good safety mechanism. Like it just, it really is. Um, so both are good. Um, I love that, the deer collar for sure. And also it's just fun, you know, it's something different. Yeah, it is. So Kathy was responding and thanks Kathy. Um, I naturalist will help with insects as well. You can send them a picture of the insects and the, I haven't used it personally yet, but I know many others who use it all the time. Okay, great. So there's maybe an all-in-one solution, iNaturalist, which is great. Yeah, because I find even like with an, in, I, have in, I have books, I, I, I'm a big, I just like looking at it in a book and just looking through it. But I find with insects, it's really, really hard to find what you're looking for. You can kind of get it narrowed down, but there are just so many, many insects that iNaturalist is just, uh, so much, so much faster. It's amazing. Yeah. And sometimes if you write a description into Google, they miraculously know the answer and suddenly yeah. <laughs> images and there's your bug. You're like, wow, who knew? It's all about learning. And it's that whole idea of, you know, don't be afraid, just go out. Even if you don't know what the insect is or the flower is or the, you know, yeah, the, yeah just get involved, I think. Well, in my movie, you saw the pink noodle bug, didn't you? Yes, I did. That, yeah, see, that's with the pink noodle bug. Yeah, incredible new creation. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so uh, keep coming with the questions, everyone. We're almost done for this evening. I have another one here for you, Nancy. Um, how would you respond to a student with a negative attitude to the outdoors? So if they're afraid of things like worms, spiders, snakes, or if they think it's uncool uh, to be interested in nature, how do you overcome the discomfort that some kids have with nature? When I'm programming for children in general, I try to diversify my program so that I try to tap into all different kinds of kids. So the ones that like to do the running games and the ones that like to do the more sitting and looking stuff and the ones that like to be maybe a little more competitive or whatever it may be. Um, so that I try so that those kids that, oh, I don't like this part, at least they had a part that they, that they really, really were into. Um, with regards to, I actually haven't found even with grade sevens and eights that that cool factory because there's all there's always something that they're doing socially that they're enjoying so maybe they're not looking for the things I'm asking them to look for but they are interacting and they're doing something with the students um, I had one student who was really really interested in bugs and really really scared of them so often you have to, I, I try not to say, oh, you'll be fine. I don't, I don't ever say that because it's, it's a true fear for, for many people. So I often try to pair up those students with someone who doesn't mind touching and so that they can keep a distance, but learn from a distance um, and to try and bridge that gap. I had one student who was there, wanted to read all about bees and read all about insects. So I gave him the actual, you know, the, I had a book about them. So he got that. And then he worked with someone who just wanted to dig and look. And so he tried to identify. So trying to, um, making sure you help those students move away from their fears, but also uh, acknowledging that, hey, that's okay. And let's see, let's still learn, but you don't have to touch things you don't want to touch. So yeah, I think it's yeah. a slow, progressive, repetitive, yeah the enjoyment not forcing the issue um and and i do notice a difference in attitude when i get to a class that's been outside a lot it's it's really really evident that they've been outside because there's so much more comfort and i'm sure there were a lot of those students or a few at least that at the beginning of the year were having some of those doubts or or fears so yeah, modeling practice and being calm is excellent. So Lucy, Lucy added that, which is so important. Yeah, so it was just saying, that's all right. Oh yes, that's a wasp. We're just gonna give it its space. We're not going to jump around because that makes it upset. You know, all those, all those things that even inside you're like, get the wasp. Ah. Yeah, so, so modeling is an excellent way to do it too. 
what are some of the benefits you see in the kids that you work with who have developed like an understanding of nature or have like a, a connection or a relationship with nature that's on a more regular basis? What are the things that you're seeing that you're excited about? Oh, I, I love seeing, seeing uh, the empathetic empathy that's um, part of those connections that are made in nature and the gentleness and the and such care for living things like caring that the baby bird may not make it and caring that you know all it, that is really wonderful to see because if they're caring about the earth they're also caring about humans they're caring about plants and hopefully they're later on in life they continue their caring so i i think that's the most exciting part part for me that's amazing very gentle gentle yes i think we'll wrap up the q a now i don't see any more questions coming in um, but i think we've had a great discussion so i just um like i said earlier you guys can go to the website to sign up for the next two webinars um thank you for attending it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood um Tonight is, a, is the second workshop in a series of four. And our next workshop is with Jacob Rodenberg from Camp Kwartha. And again, for those of you who need it, on the Pathway Stewardship website, get started, workshops. If you wanna to talk to Nancy more, you can go to consultants, you'll see her there. You can find her email and information about her Think Outside program. Thank you, Nancy, so much for taking the time to be with us today. And thank you for everybody who came to this evening workshop. We know you have busy lives and we appreciate you being here with us. If you would like to say hi to Nancy, the floor is open. Otherwise, thank you and good night.